Well, I just got through making a uh, video about a uh, about the, a tour of this 1991 Mercedes 420 SEL, just going over some of the design features and uh, the condition of the vehicle and things like that. But I wanted to take a few minutes while I have the car out here to go over some of the um, some maintenance items that you might want to look out for if any one of you guys watching this has a 420 SEL or 560 SEL or maybe a little bit older I think a 400 SEL or 500 SEL if it's pre-85 for the uh, W126 body style and um, perhaps one of the uh, best features of this car that I like the most that I'll show you guys and the reason I'm focusing on the hood is because it has a unique hood lash mech or hood hinge mechanism right now the hood position is basically the normal hood position you see on most cars but if you look closely here you've got these little levers and what that's for is it allows you to tilt the hood much farther back um, as you can tell it's got an extremely large battery which is very heavy it would be very awkward to uh, work that out of there unless you got a really strong back so um, let me demonstrate that for you guys real quick and show you what I'm talking about. That's probably not something you see every day. It's kind of scary looking, actually. You'd think that somebody drove under a garage door with a hood open and bent the hell out of it. But uh, I just wanted to take a quick video of that to show you. A car with a hood that'll go 90 degrees open. Um, I mentioned in my previous video a lot of people think that these cars are just, oh, I don't want to get a Mercedes, they're too expensive, can't work on them, can't work on these foreign cars. Um, not always the case. This car was designed to be serviced. It was designed to be, to last a lifetime. Cars of this type were viewed as heirlooms. And um, with a hood back like that, you've got ready access to everything everything right out here in front of you you can work on it don't have to worry about banging your head against the hood like on a lot of other cars you can take the engine and transmission out just lift it right up still have one of the hooks for it and of course the uh, battery which is around 70 pounds you can just lift that right on out not a problem you can also work down in here and clean if you needed to and also access the uh, wiper mechanism by the way this grill here is actually metal as well too just painted black you can see some of the paint wearing off um, so that's a that's a really good feature to have they, they really want you to be able to work on these cars and fix the car properly and safely um, one of the other things I'll talk about is the uh, electrical system a little bit because I recently had a problem with it. Uh, my wipers quit working actually. And um, all the fuses and circuit breakers and relays are right under here in this panel. And of course everything's nice and labeled. It's got these uh, European style fuses, I like to call them. I'm not really sure what the technical term would be. But um, you've got dissimilar materials, basically. You've got 
a tin aluminum mix there and copper here. And um, even though this fuse panel has a gasket surround, which keeps the majority of the moisture out, still moisture does end up getting in here and um, corrodes the interface between the fuse and the uh, receiver. And I'm pointing at that fuse there particularly because that's the fuse I had a problem with. And uh, what happens is, is you get corrosion in between here and it eventually um, eats the uh, material away where you have a lot of arcing. And uh, this was the fuse that I had a problem with. You can see how that's all eaten away because it just sat there and uh, got corroded and arced and eventually failed. Didn't make any contact. And um, that's actually pretty bad because the way this car is designed, this fuse powers the wiper motor as well as the rear defrost. And I, I say that's bad because um, a lot of the American cars that I've worked on, uh, critical systems like that are actually on what they call a self-resetting circuit breaker. Your headlights and your uh, power windows um, and your windshield wipers, maybe some, maybe some other consumers, they're on self-resetting circuit breakers. For example, if you're in the dead of winter and you have some ice buildup on the windshield and you're not aware of that and you go to turn the wipers on, they may temporarily be locked up and draw a lot of current from the motor because they're stuck to the windshield. Um, in this car, if that were to happen, it would blow the fuse and the fuse would stay blown and you'd have to come out here and, and fix it. They do give you these spare fuses for that very purpose. So that sort of mitigates the uh, the problem, but um, it's still, I think, in my opinion, better to have a self-resetting circuit breaker so that when you uh, clear up the problem on the windshield, uh, the wipers will resume operation. Uh, a lot of times, actually, with the, the way those circuit breakers work is it'll actually just slow the wipers down because the circuit breaker goes on and off and on and off until the uh, overcurrent condition has been cleared up. So what you want to do to prevent what happened to me is um, periodically you want to just come in here, grab these fuses, and just kind of rotate them back and forth like that. And uh, that'll uh, eliminate a lot of the oxidation buildup between these two surfaces there and uh, prolong the life of the fuses and perhaps prevent problems from occurring in the future. So that's, that's a gotcha item there. Um, Another thing to look out for is the PCV system, positive crankcase ventilation. Um, it starts right here, and uh, you're not going to be able to see very well, but uh, sort of uh, ends right there. And um, these hoses tend to get extremely hard and brittle, so you just want to check those, make sure they're nice and supple. And the way this engine is designed, it's got an orifice, a metered orifice down in there for a controlled vacuum leak basically that draws all the crankcase gases through this hose into the intake system to be burned. That's why this area here is kind of moist with oil. So you just want to loosen this Allen head right there. I think it's a 10 millimeter. Move that aside out of the way. Lift that up and maybe take a little uh, paper clip and go down in there and just see if there's any obstructions down in there. <clears throat> Maybe about once a year, perhaps. Uh, it's very easy to plug up, and when that happens, um, all those crankcase vapors that would normally be burned within the engine are going to build up into the crankcase and cause massive corrosion problems and sludge problems, which you don't want to have, because rebuilding one of these motors is not cheap. So um, when I got this car, I went ahead and did that, and that's why these hoses are nice and soft. And I unfortunately did find a plugged orifice down in there. But um, when I changed the valve cover gaskets with new ones, the engine was very, very clean. So I think that it might have just happened. I think I got that just in time. So I feel pretty good about that. Uh, another thing to do when you're under the hood um, you know, checking your air filter, maybe replacing the element, is to lubricate these ball joints on your throttle control mechanism. You want to just basically grab it with both hands and pop
pop that off in that direction and put some lithium grease in there and pop that on and, and work that in there. That'll reduce the play. This has a little bit of play because of the mileage, but it's not so bad. Too much play in there make that very difficult to keep an adjustment and make it harder for the electronic throttle control to come up with a precise position of the butterfly valve. Um, same thing back in there. You've got these ball joints everywhere on your throttle linkage, so you just want to lubricate your pivot points back there and also the, the ball joints as well as the uh, transmission lever as well too. Just regular lithium grease will uh, work just fine for that. Um, another thing, particularly on a high mileage car, is the uh, alternator. And um, the alternators are very expensive, being a Mercedes-Benz. This is a, a, a Bosch 14 volt 80 amp unit. And it's the original alternator. And uh, what you can do, if you look closely on the back there, and you see that little black button looking thing, that's the voltage regulator and brush holder. And what you can do is you can um, loosen the alternator from the block and move it aside. You don't have to disconnect any of the wires. And just take a Phillips screwdriver and remove that regulator combination brush holder and replace it when you have to. Most of the problems with alternators when they go quote unquote bad is because the brushes wear down. They no longer make contact with the slip rings. So the um, alternator output basically drops to zero when you think the alternator is bad and you go buy a new one. It could be very expensive, around $280 to $300, a lot of money. Of course, the new one's going to have new bearings front and back and be tested, maybe have new diodes as well, too. But um, a lot of times, all you need to do is just replace the brushes in there. And um, I've done that on this car when I first got it back in September. And I'll uh, show you guys what that looks like so you can see. So there was the regulator, 14 volt, and you can see that I got that just in time. These brushes are supposed to be about a half inch to, yeah, I think about a half inch long, and they're almost worn down to the plastic housing. In fact, you can see some abnormal wear there, evidence of arcing. So that alternator was about ready to leave me on the side of the road eventually, probably sooner rather than later. So that's just something you want to look out for when you have uh, an alternator like this. The same alternator is used on BMWs as well too, um, and maybe, maybe some other cars, German cars as well. So that's one other thing you want to look out for. And uh, for the most part, that's basically some of the maintenance items I wanted to share with you, some of the uh, low-hanging fruit items, if you will. Um, this car has got a horrible problem with brake dust. It's got some uh, high friction brake pads, so the car stops very well, but the wheels, after about a week, get really dusty. So I'll be making a, a video on um, how to replace the front brake pads on these cars, which is also something that you should be able to easily do yourself and uh, save a ton of money on doing that as well as get the kind of brake pads that you want versus what just happens to be available at the, at the dealer at the time you go or the uh, service garage that you go. Uh, this car, before I made the uh, video about it, has developed a slight issue with the uh, passenger side rear window which I'll show you guys. Well, I just want to get the key in so I can uh, turn it on. I'll show you guys and see if you can help me diagnose. Let me walk around the end of the car here. This passenger side rear window rolled down and stayed down when it was just about to rain. And, um, I'll be making a video about the repair of that too, or at least I'll try to. I've never had that door panel off. I've never 
um, worked on the interior of these cars. So I've got to do a little research on how to do that. But um, here's what it does. So it sounds like a, re a regular power window motor when it goes down. Of course, glass didn't move anywhere. And now I'll uh, raise it up. You can see it moved just a little bit. A very weird problem to have. I've never had uh, this particular failure mode of a power window. Usually it's the actual, uh, either the switch goes bad because it doesn't make any contact, or the brushes in the motor, just like the alternator, don't make contact against the commutator and uh, the motor just won't work. And then sometimes, depending upon the design, if you've got the kind of regulator, window regulator that has the cables and pulleys, sometimes the cables snap. It looks to me, or sounds to me, just by um, actually weighing the mechanism, that the, the regulator itself is, uh, is moving up and down, but for some reason has lost contact with the glass, which is a very interesting problem, actually. But it also gives me confidence that it might not be that bad to fix. I was thinking I might have to buy a brand new regulator or a remanufactured regulator, but I just have to wait and see after I uh, get that door panel off to see what I'm looking at. It might just be that a rivet popped out or something like that, and I can go ahead and replace that with a um, you know, nut and bolt kind of arrangement. So um, like any 21-year-old car, it does have its issues. But um, interestingly enough, when it failed, um, I can get that regulator to come all the way up and jam against the bottom of the window, and the window will not go down drive it when you're driving along, so I don't have to worry about rain getting inside the car or anything like that. So um, not sure when I'll be able to, to get around to that. I've got my uh, Cannondale M700 bike to fix once those parts finally come in. But um, I do intend on making more videos of the car. Uh, just as things go wrong and I address issues with it and, and make general repairs, I'll try to make videos to uh, be able to show you guys and um, hopefully provide some uh, good tips for you guys if you want to work on your own W126.